Yeah, hi, hello everyone. Welcome to the panel discussion on uh, data security challenges for uh, fintech uh, companies. Uh, we have a very interesting uh, panel with us. We have Ashwat from Razorpay, uh, AVS from uh, Zeta, and Ankur from uh, PhonePay. The format that I have in mind is that we will have the panelists share their initial opening thoughts on the subject. And uh, then we have some specific speaking points and then we will open it up for the audience for uh, Q&A. Uh, to begin with, uh, FinTech is a space that has seen phenomenal growth in the last uh, decade, I would say, in India. And, men, and, and I think all of us are on the front lines of cybersecurity. We've interacted or worked with uh, FinTech companies and we've seen that there has been uh, marked evolution in their approach to cybersecurity from the time when I remember uh, there was no concept of a CISO at some of the largest uh, startups and they were already at unicorn, multi-unicorn valuations uh, to the point when they started to say, oh, we'll do everything uh, in-house and, you know, they were using Apache, Metron and I'm sure many of them still are and they have strong engineering teams who managed to get value from that beast of a platform. To the extent where, you know, uh, now it's a very mature practice, security is shifting left, there are dedicated security teams. All the three panelists here are part or leading the security teams at their respective organizations. There are significant investments being made in cybersecurity. Um, some of that has been driven by uh, investor um, pressure. Some of that has been driven by uh, companies looking to list publicly. And of course, a lot of it gets driven by regulatory pressure, which we will talk about shortly. And uh, in the context specifically of the certain guidelines that uh, have been released recently. So with those uh, opening remarks, um, I was going to go to each of you alphabetically, but I now just realized that all three of you start with the letter A. So I will have to do a little more hard work. Yes, Ankur will start with you. <laughs> so any opening thoughts uh, you have on the subject, you know, in terms of what you're doing at phone pay, and then we'll dive in a bit. Sure, thanks, uh, KK. I think, so I'll start with again a word called FinTech and just drive down into why this word came right uh, there's a tech in the world and that's where the whole difference is right uh, these companies probably which we call about fintech these are basically tech oriented companies uh, they call themselves as tech companies not the financial organizations or or a bank right um, and when tech plays a hard role in such a company who's stealing in financial data and all those things security takes a much more priority and all these companies are digital first which means their, their customer interactions and all those things have to be really really frictionless right and they, they basically uh, take a lot of time in in improving their customer experience and these are the companies who who do who you guys might be using for instant fund transfer or they promote lending in 10 minutes right these kind of products crazy products where um, it's it's very fast when they when they play or when they do something on that side. And hence, when you talk about security here, uh, when you have to do an instant funds transfer, uh, a fraud team or let's say a trust and safety team has a very little time to understand what this transaction is about, and they have they have to do a lot of work in background without right. com compromising, compromising the speed. Right. So in short, I think uh, there's a lot to handle. There's a lot of data to be taken care of. Um, and the data can be any anywhere, right? It might be with your third party, or now we call it fourth party, fifth party, and sixth party. We don't know about it. So I think there's a lot to do here. These are my opening thoughts. Uh, over yeah, to you, thanks, Ankur. That's uh, interesting insight. You know, we'll come back to the speed and the agility part and how security yeah. needs to keep uh, step with that, right? We don't want uh, the old school banking style where you say, oh, I'll release a RFP for doing the APT of my app, right? That's correct. <laughs> well, I've moved uh, a long way from that. Great, thank yeah. you. So, Ashwat, uh, over to yeah. you from uh, Razorpay. If you can share sure. some thoughts with us. Sure, sure. Thank you, thank you, KK. Thank you, Ankur. Um, so, quick intro. My name is Ashwat. I work as um, a staff engineer in the security team at Razorpay. I head uh, cloud and infra security, and I also help out with data security and a little bit on the security monitoring piece. Um, so to allude to what Ankur said, right? I think we, uh, I think all three companies, right? We have a great responsibility on our shoulders 
because there are multiple businesses who are dependent on our success right so for example if something go, goes bad here then you know end customers are impacted for example if you take the example of razer pay an end merchant will not be able to do that transactions and phone pay you know and zeta uh, an end uh, kirana shop will not be able to make payments right so that's the impact uh, you know uh, that each of the companies have so a long time ago one of my managers from microsoft uh, told me this right so think of an x axis and a y axis uh, x axis of usability and y axis of security so if you increase the usability then you know the security drops yeah. right um so you need to strike a fine balance between the two things so where you make the system usable for both the developers and the end consumers uh, and keep the product folks also happy and also have security in the play um so i think the easiest way the we need to change our mentality also like the security team to kind of bake security in and make it super easy for developers so that they don't have to put in additional effort you know we as a security team can put in more effort to make life easy for developers and security becomes a part and parcel of uh, you know the development life cycle that's all for me today great 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 thank you ashwa um evs would you hi good afternoon everybody and uh, i'm prabhakar i am at uh, no i'm cr co at zeta uh, from the information security or the cyber security at the you know fintech from the scale perspective um, visibility is very important because the kind of data it is coming the kind of impact it has on the you know on the consumers or the customers and the experience what they face uh, as an individual customer we are using many of the services many of the applications we know the, how it really hurts or how it impacts even our own experience and the trauma we go through if at all something goes on so that's very very important so uh, it has come to light because of may, many reasons one is that uh, self discipline and as a culture that is one part of life and second uh, compliance through the compliance and through the regulations uh, and uh, uh, to a great extent uh, with the best practices implementation so you are going to achieve lot of these you uh, know areas and second by the organization culture and also by the a commitment to the uh, security implementation these are all very important uh, irrespective of the industry uh, fintech happens to be you know a very sensitive industry because you deal with a lot of you know financial products services and all otherwise as a subject if you see the information security or cyber security across the domain irrespective of the industry it's very 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 important because uh the adversaries uh, you know their tactics their tools their procedures everything is changing so they are very dynamic so uh, in a nutshell if you wanted to say that you know um, practically you don't have any chance to sleep but uh, the adversary requires only one chance to succeed that's how it is it's a very right. highly imba- highly imbalanced game yeah asymmetric uh, warfare right great uh thank you prabhakar i'll uh, shortly come back to you i want to start with uh, ashwat if you can tell us uh because you're covering a wide uh, kind of range of app cloud infra so if you can give us some uh practical tips and tools as to how you mentioned this term bake in security right uh, so could you give us some tips tools maybe some examples from your experience as to how you uh, tried to do this at uh, uh razor pay sure. um, so i think the first and the key piece is identifying all of the data sources um so you know when we started looking at the data security problem first piece was identify all of the data sources right uh, one can sit on something like slack google drive uh, for example we use sumo logic for logging sumo logic and a couple of other different pieces right um so there are tools for for example if you pick google drive or slack there are automated tools where you just give it like a pattern and just you know it goes after it so step 1 identify all of the data sources step 2 would be identify all of the pieces of information which are uh, sensitive uh, so that you know then kind of draw regexes out of this then the third piece is risk rank you know whatever is your most risky data sources and whatever has the most exposure then go after those uh, one after another so for example at razorpay what we did was we started with slack and then we went to sumo logic so those were like the uh, two things that we were tackling and um, some lessons learned here right 
at Sumo Logic, one thing that we learned was developers would like access to the complete ones, right? Because they want to figure out, okay, who's the customer, who, which merchant are they doing a transaction and on what, what was the time, what was the amount and all of those details, right? But at the same time, you can't make everything public. So you have to have some kind of a restriction on what is exposed and what is not. Uh, so that's where if you do it post facto, it's always tricky. So what we learned was it's best to do it at the ingestion layer where anytime a log is getting written, this ingestion layer will check if it matches the regex, it will either go remove it or it will uh, sanitize it and we'll just put like the last three digits or whatever, right? So that is one thing that, you know, was a lesson learned for us. And uh, at the application security level, any uh, thoughts you want to share on that? How you help bring security to your customer sure. mobile apps, APIs, etc.? Sure. So specifically, I'll, I'll just touch upon specifically the logging layer, uh, KK. So um, one thing we found was uh, we, we do development mostly in like maybe two or three languages for most part. So for all of these, we have written our own logging library. It's called Secure Logging Library. And we give the developers three options, right? So one, if it is sensitive data, then you can either mask it or you can encrypt it, you know, if it's really required or third pieces, you can hash it. So encrypt would be like the last option. Uh, we either prefer you know, them uh, removing everything and masking it or, you know, hashing is still okay, but encryption is to, to serve as like the last option. And in general, when it comes to application security, um, uh, the one thing that you know we have uh, learned is uh, we have used we're using SEMgrep pretty well, and uh, we are writing like a lot of custom rules. We are in constant touch with the company, and SAST has kind of worked out uh, well for us. Uh, okay. So in and, this tool uh, you mentioned SEMgrep. Uh, yeah, SEM. Yeah, it's SEMgrep called SEMgrep, and uh, uh, th there is an open source version of the tool as well where you get like a bunch of libraries uh, or a bunch of checks for free. And uh, then in the enterprise version, you can do more things like you can schedule scan, you can get like enterprise support, you can add more rules and so on. So what we have done is we have, part, uh, we have made it uh, as a part of the pipeline where uh, SEMgrep will run automatically. And again, this was an iterative process where we did not turn it on in blocking mode initially. So we had to clear up all of the old uh, debt file and now, you know, part by part, we are turning it on uh, blocking. Great, great. Thank you, Ashwat. Um, so now, uh, Ankur, uh, one aspect that I wanted to explore further with you. So two, my, my question to you has two parts. One is if you would like to add further to Ashwat's points on shifting security left, making it further deeply into the product uh, life cycle, uh, please feel free to share insights on that. And also you mentioned this speed aspect, which kind of ties into uh, integrating security into the product lifecycle as well. So if you can also throw some light into how you help security come up to speed, you know, because security always is uh, seen as a laggard or, or, or a bottleneck towards uh, releasing uh, new features or releasing new modules. So, so both of those aspects, if you can throw light on. Sure. So in terms of fintech and generally talking about startups, I, I think this is my third startup in India um, in the last nine to 10 years. And the moment I've joined a startup, I could feel and sense, and I'll come to Dev, DevSecOps part, but just a bit of background before I start that. Mm. Majority of the companies, uh, when you look at now also, even if they have their own security team or if they don't have, um, QAs, products, and the development team, they work very well in tandem with each other. And they understand QA is very, very important because they think QA is basically a sort of enabler for them, right? And by enabler, I mean that they don't treat them as a blocker. They know if QA is not properly done, their functionality might break in production and things, and the basic core functionality might not work, right? Uh, and in terms of security, uh, security teams are usually treated as their blockers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they will block something, they will identify some security issue, and then the release cycle will probably have to postpone or something of that sort, right? The shift left mechanism was meant to basically make sure the speed of security bugs or identifying them much earlier in the process has changed, right? And the more you shift left, 
and I could see that successfully happening in, in majority of the companies these days. The more you shift left, the speed of figuring out new bugs and getting them fixed much earlier in the cycle improves, right? And as rightly mentioned by Ashwat, I think uh, SEMGAP is becoming very famous these days. You guys are trying to explore that um, and started writing custom rules on, on that sort also. Our SAS and DAS are again sorted out. We have identified some tooling around how to identify um, uh, dependencies, how to how to block if there's a dependency which is more than certain uh, level. Uh, I think shifting left has helped us a lot. Another thing which has helped us and I consider this as a part of shifting left itself is other than tooling also, we started doing PRD reviews, design reviews. Uh, like this is probably not part of the tooling side, but it is again, much more than before even the code has uh, been started coding, developers has even started coding. We understand the design, we understand the PRDs and start figuring out and calling out if there are any threat related issues or any security related issues. And based on these design documents, we also give them a best practice document. This is what you have to take care of while you're coding or deploying the, the code. So this has helped us a lot uh, in maturing security uh, at various other con uh, uh, companies which have all done in the past. Super, super. I'll come back to both of you uh, more in terms of sure. process and tooling uh, you know, on, at the ground level. Uh, yeah. Plus some more questions I have, but I wanted to uh, shift the focus a bit to the governance culture aspect. So Pravakar, you have uh, referenced this a few times in your opening remarks and the discussion we were having earlier. Could you throw some light on how you've, uh, or what advice you would have, some insights into how to change the culture, how to bring about more awareness across the layers, you know, from management to product leads to developers, testers, etc. Yeah, uh, it was one is the awareness and uh, that's very critical. So make awareness uh, truly interactive. So, and second is that we have to ensure that it is ingrained. Why, how we have to do is one is that whenever you're developing a product, we used to call no in the olden days, we used to call it stated in stated requirements and implied requirements. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing called implied now. So now it is granted. So security is granted. So you, nobody will come and tell you that, you know, you should have a rich UI or you should have a, you know, this kind of a feature and all. So security is taken for granted. So you have to ensure that the security features are uh, taken right from, forget about the requirement. Requirement, what I mean is that the functional requirement, the kind of features and USPs and all. But security, you have to do it every requirement like you know application calls for some 14 15 important requirements to protect yourself either from access perspective or to support your incident management or uh, to support your you know web application security or mobile application security there are various things you do and various processes various checklists various tools we use a lot of things we use so we have to tell people that these are all right granted nobody will come and tell you that why your password policy is weak why logging is not happening why certain fields are not captured in the login or why uh, what you call uh, you have to do masking of this particular field so by design we have to tell them that the kind of data you get to your network how you are transmitting how you are processing how you are storing it's it's like you know it, it's a culture you have to understand yes if if in doubt how to handle this field better to protect it so it's by default. Don't even ask that question whether a particular standard is asking you to mask it, a particular standard is asking you not to log it. Don't even get into that. Just think when I'm coding, I'm getting this input for my particular processing. Is this input really I have to keep it plain? Or what is the importance of this particular piece of data part of my product? Then take a decision. Yes, it is very sensitive. I know because we are all human beings. By common sense, we don't. I get uh, no SSN number. How to handle it? It's very sensitive or not? As an individual, because we are all coding. Yeah. While coding itself, we know that. So we have to take the decision. Of course, we providing the policies, checklists, documents, compliance, a lot of things you do. But we have to make sure that certain of these things, by you know, uh, like you know, by upbringing, we come to know a lot of things. So something like that we have to make part of our organization culture also. Of course, you have policy, you have procedure, you have compliance, all those things. 
even otherwise your coding itself you know that what kind of data you are taking how you are processing what kind of output you are giving while doing your coding itself you know what are the things you are taking and what is that piece of code is doing for you or what kind of request you are getting what kind of response you are giving so if you apply a little bit of brain there automatically a lot of things will be ingrained and a lot of things will be taken care of. so we have to make sure that this thought process is going together one i agree with you i agree but i would want to dig a bit deeper with you as to how do you get this yeah of course the one one point is that you will give the policies you tell these are all the sense to data we get in identify your inventory of data what you get and how you are processing how you are storing what the implications of all those things any of you keep telling them at the same time you have to apply your thought process around all these areas while you are doing coding so you have yeah. to think that you are doing a very it's a craft for me coding is a craft so you have to craft it very carefully so that no loose pieces so ensure that your craft is correct and while you are crafting you are taking care of all the pieces properly to take care of the three pieces all the minimum guidelines are given the minimum uh, knowledge is provided the policies are provided a lot of things we provide but while you are ultimately the guy who is doing has to ensure that these inputs are grasped and implemented True. so that is where we have to give a lot of education and we have to tell them this is how it is give a lot of examples tell them while working with them on the policy document and even the one or two uh, points they may get new example today you have a policy suddenly you will get one more uh, no requirement so instead of waiting for the policy yes now i got a, another yes can i handle like this of course you have a lot of gates lot of tooling we do all those things i'm not a right. i'm purely telling from a governance and culture perspective so an individual if he questions himself the kind of data what i am getting what is the piece of code i am doing how i am ensuring the uh, the security or privacy whatever the uh, way i have to process this and what kind of output i have to give if that thought process is put into the minds of the people whoever it is one part is only the application of the development but there is a large uh, chunk of crowd they are not associated with the development still they are also weaklings so right. that is where the governance and culture is very important great so uh, thanks uh, prabhakar so uh, back to you know any of you now i'll just ask questions that either of you can just kind of raise your hand and and choose to answer it uh, first point i want to go back to ashwath's point of you know figuring out what is the data that you are handling and where is it stored and uh, what formats it is in the basic data discovery exercise any tools that you would like to recommend or have you guys largely done it using homegrown scripts i can take a step first and then you can go next so we evaluated macy aws macy so there's a page like almost a complete aws shop uh, so we did evaluate macy uh, so macy is like a managed uh, solution by aws where uh, you can give it like formats and it will go through s3 buckets and uh, uh, a couple of other resources and it will tell you if there's any uh, sensitive data so that is one piece that we evaluated but it didn't really work out for us because uh, S3 was just one of the repositories. We had like multiple other repositories, so we are still evaluating Macy. Uh, and uh, the other piece that uh, you know is kind of working well for us is uh, at Razorpay we have like a big AWS, uh, a big data lake, which is not specifically on AWS, so it's, it's built by ourselves. Uh, so we have uh, it's mostly on uh, Apache stack. Uh, so we use this tool called Apache Ranger. which is specifically meant for the purpose where if there is any sensitive data coming in then you can either mask it or hash it or encrypt it or you can just completely block that particular request so that is also like another uh, tool in kind of tool and the third tool is uh, we had to do things ourselves in a small way uh, where it was more like trial and error and then you know we wrote it at the ingestion layer so i hope that answered your question okay Yeah, great. This is the same. The sumo logic piece where you're ingesting the logs, so you wrote parsers at that stage only. Correct. Yeah, at the ingestion point itself, we wrote the parser so that it would drop it right at the ingestion layer. So uh, the, again, you know, the cleanup we we used to do cleanup, and every now and then we would say, hey, uh, you know, personal information is there or sensitive information is there, and the cleanup we would go do it, but it would be a spot fix, and we knew in the back of our heads. that this is like a spot fix and it's not like a complete fix right so that's where you know ingestion layer was great thank you ashwin
Ankur, you would like to weigh in with something? Yeah, I think uh, we've tried the hit. We've tried a similar hit and trial approach in past. I think uh, mostly homegrown scripts have worked for us, uh, and it is working for us well right now. So uh, since we're not using any cloud uh, infrastructure as of now, we have our own private cloud. Uh, homegrown scripts work well for us. Great, great. My next uh, uh, question again, uh, please, any of you feel free to step in. Um, container security. Uh, I assume most of your environments are partially or fully containerized, or at least there is some initiative towards that. Um, so container security, any thoughts on how are you securing your containerized environments? I'll go first and probably uh, Prabhakar or Ashok can take a shot on this. Yeah. I think so what we have done till now is uh, we use Kate, uh, and I think most of us would be using it as of yeah. now. And what we have done is we have basically hard, hardened our base images. Uh, and we have a lot of automation whenever a container is formed and there's a deployment happening on that side. So I think our base image is, is sorted out. Um, and if you have to make a change in a base image, there is a lot of approval process which is needed. Mm -hmm. So um, it becomes nearly impossible for anyone to change the basic core image. And that's how we are trying to uh, sort things out. Okay. Ashwin, more uh, specifically, how are you monitoring container security? Because you have done, I think, a fairly intense deployment of Sumo Logic. So uh, is, does that cover your containerized containers also? Right. So uh, container, you know, let me break it down into uh, rather three pieces. So the first piece is, you know, where the container, container images it, itself are stored. So these are like the container repository, like what Ankur was talking about. So we do like a scan and there are open source tools like Trivi. Uh, which do a scan on the container image. So that's the first piece where, you know, base image is secure, then also we run like a scan on the image itself. Then the second piece is, um, there is a control plane of Kubernetes. So we also use Kubernetes. Uh, so there's a control plane of Kubernetes. And since we are hosted on AWS, so AWS gives us some functionalities around the uh, control plane of Kubernetes. So this is where we run some more checks. Uh, so this is covered by most uh, cloud security posture management tools where they do look at the control plane of EKS, which is the managed version of the AWS managed Kubernetes version. And then there's the third piece of the Kubernetes uh, cluster itself. So this is where you know, there are maybe two or three subparts. So the first subpart is around, uh, so this you would need like the access to the Kubernetes uh, Kub control or kubectl. So this is where we look at the manifest file. Uh, and so that is, uh, at the container level itself. And also we look at, you know, how is the pod configured and so on. And also we look at some pieces around, um, is, uh, are the secrets securely managed? What kind of port access is present in all of the things, right? So three subparts. So the first subpart is taken care of by tools like Trivi. Second subpart is by the CSPM. And the third subpart, we are currently using an open source tool uh, called Kube Bench, uh, K-U-B-E uh, hyphen bench. Uh, so this has some basic checks, but we are also exploring other things. All right, excellent. Uh, Prabhakar, would you like yeah. to share something? Yes. Yeah, again, uh, uh, there are two parts, uh, uh, not two, three, or any number of parts, but before even the container, that, the, that will be taken care part of the CI, CD itself, so that uh, the uh, baking the image and uh, first of all, hardening that image or understanding uh, either our own or we can subscribe and we can take those things that is one part of life uh, and also going through your ci gates uh, various tools that scan and uh, uh, that will be pushed and second runtime security we call it uh, cp and that is the uh, part of runtime security again there are various tools you can use to detect and give you that and also there are certain controls on the cloud provider native tools are also available to detect those uh, controls and that. On top of it, again, we have our own uh, uh, ELK stack we built, so that uh, that is part of you know your uh, security monitoring piece, even management and all. And we have written, uh, wrote a lot of rules based on those uh, activities, and uh, at every layer, so that you know that is another piece. I don't want to get too much into the architectural details, but basically. This is how it works. Uh, one is on the your CI/CD pipeline, then the runtime and uh, observability. Uh, we call it. 
so that's how it happens the monitoring and it's a you know again a, a feedback and i can correct those things mm. and that's how it runs and so, Prabhakar, since we tools we use yeah since we have you on on the line um, on mute and one very important point you brought up in the initial conversation and also i think you're uh, hinting at it now is visibility so can you tell us a little bit about how you've uh, worked on in improving visibility and does when you say visibility it can i'm not sure what it what you're implying but maybe you can touch upon different aspects of visibility one is in terms of the metrics in that are reported to senior management in terms of the security teams visibility on the uh, it landscape you know the real estate that you have it estate that you have so different aspects of this visibility if you can throw some light on yeah uh, basically i wanted to talk a lot of things at the, the conceptual and the policy level uh, for various sure. reasons um basically uh, the visibility or the what i mean by visibility is that uh, we should have the clarity that what we are trying to protect that's very important that's what i mean by visibility hmm. so if we are very clear that what is that we are trying to protect the big picture then it's a layered security it is not that you know one tool or one particular activity of your environment is protecting the entire stuff so that once you know that uh, these are all the critical assets how to protect or these are all the flows or whatever it is. so then what we will do is that we will apply that you know layered security and we will architect our entire environment around it we will build our policies we will select our tooling all those things will happen on that then uh, critical monitoring uh, because otherwise your metrics will go many you can uh, write some 30 40 metrics or 100 metrics also but what is your absolutely critical metrics or a behavioral metrics or uh, you know we talk about uh, micro segmentation zero trust what is that exactly you are trying to do certain metrics from access perspective very critical for you certain metrics from behavior perspective very critical for you certain metrics from the uh, system side resources side so that is what is very critical everything is very tailor made that i never suggest a lot of generic practices practices are good policies are very good but take them and look at your environment how do i map these policies or these generic stuff to my environment from my environment today i am in healthcare for me the critical uh, environment the critical uh, data i have to protect is totally different from my manufacturing stuff so that is the uh point i wanted to drive so take all your policies and uh, these are all very generic and conceptual level everything is good but try to apply to your environment and try to get the visibility okay at the perimeter level right from edge to your database or to your core so just make it like a small small chunks and blocks and so see how it is working and see where you have to put the gates or filters or alerts hooks whatever you call it so yeah i i stop with this don't want to go too much about that yeah um ankur anything in terms of metrics reporting how do you measure your success at you know shifting security left sure okay yeah, i think uh, so when we run all these tools which we are talking about uh, name a tool for container one trivi or semgrep or any any dashboard tools or anything anything of this sort right but there is there are a lot of consumers for these this kind of a data or report of vulnerabilities whatever you want to call it right the the consumers might be developers the consumers might be the security team itself the developer or or the consumer might be the leaders leaders who want to see a general dashboard on how are we progressing in security or generating a single big score of our organization where we are right now let's say out of 100 we are 80 right now how do we make it 82 or 83 next quarter right so i think uh, we are still working on it but uh, working on a central vulnerability management dashboard where we could see everything going around all the systems all the tools and everything probably start a scan if needed by that ui by the dashboard itself and internally based on the roles we have different sort of access to different developers leadership or or security team where they can see and and, and probably see exactly what they need uh, what they need so that's how we are working or or trying to approach in that sense right right ashwath any thoughts on metrics yeah. 
I think we are uh, along the same lines as uh, Ankur, what Ankur uh, mentioned. Okay. Um, so the only additional point that I would like to make is uh, uh, initially it worked out well, like we had one single support uh, for uh, the whole company. But then the CTO came back and said, hey, I want to kind of gamify it. Can you give me a score by the BO? Uh, so then, you know, uh, he could use that as like another metric into like the BO forecast. Uh, security would drive another measure. Um, so I think getting the scorecard right was very, very important. For us. Um, so we went through a couple of iterations and initially we used to do it manually and we were supposed to get it out every month, but that was a challenge. Um, so then we revamped the whole program and it's now completely automated. Anybody can go in a, on the dashboard at any point and then they hit a refresh. It'll give you like the latest score. Uh, so those were some of the... Okay. Great, great. So the last question that I would like to uh, uh, ask, and then we'll open it up for audience questions. I have lots of questions, but I want to just keep some time for the audience also to come in. Um, the regulator, uh, one is of course RBI and RBI indirectly through uh, your customers. I think in the case of Prabhakar with Zeta, it is more customers facing regulatory pressure and then passing that those requirements on to you. So either ways, whether it is direct regulation or indirect regulation or the latest certain guidelines for monitoring and reporting incidents and maintaining logs, etc. Um, any thoughts on what are the key headaches or pain points that you have from a regulatory side? Uh, Ashwat, we've got you on the line, so maybe you could start with this and then the others sure. could. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so I think... Uh... You know, first is understanding and consuming the uh, requirement ourselves. For, so at Razorpay, we have, like I said, dedicated compliance department uh, to handle audits day in and day out. Uh, but the key piece is understanding the requirement and translating it into a security requirement and then finally to the developers or the infrastructure or the DevOps team, right? Uh, so that itself is tricky. Um, and uh, you know, there are different regulations, for example, you know, management and storage of logs. So that is also something that, you know, we have to uh, have a good grip or a handle on. And that's where uh, you know, most of our effort goes in. Uh, I don't know if that was a clear case. Great. Ankur, any thoughts from you? No, I think uh, most of these pieces... Uh, so since we are a very, very highly regulated organization, and again, a dedicated team of a good amount of people working on audits and regulations on a regular basis, uh, most of things for us in the latest certain regulations were, were already sorted out. But I think some, some of the changes which are um, dedicated time for incident reporting plus uh, maintaining logs for 180 days or if, if there's some changes in the VPN or something of that sort has to be changed. I think there's a minor, there's some sort of a minor change for us, but for us, it was it was not a big, big change. Okay, fine. Great. Uh, Prabhakar, from your end, please. Anything on the yeah, uh, regulatory pressure side? Yeah, the regulatory things, you know, the compliance perspective, definitely. A uh, lot of requirements, but if you see those requirements are also coming out of a lot of best practices to help the, you know, either from the incident perspective or from a protection perspective or from detection perspective. So various ways they are giving. And if you see, these are all already, example, you talk about NTP, very first requirement, what they talk. It's already their part of PCI and other things also, NTP central synchronization and all. Again, you know, longevity of the logs. Uh, instead of uh, you know three months live or one year of archive or, or five years so these are all the things you have to build your storage but from a regulator perspective most of these uh, uh, logs are already there for a much bigger periods uh, because most of the you know uh, regulations if you see already there from super set of regulations of rbi mm. at least certain yeah. things at least certain things if not everything uh, so what happens is that uh, they're already there. If at all we have to go and see and uh, whatever that, you know, extra bit we have to do or we have to modify, those work only we have to do. Otherwise, most of these regulations, if you see, they are a uh, subset of super set of regulations already available by, available by the bigger regulators. I'm not talking about all, at least few. 
Right. So basically, you're saying that this, at least this latest circular from certain, has not come as a major challenge. That this is part of what you guys it are. It could doing. be, but we have to figure out what is that we are doing, how much it is already available, how much of the delta we have to see. But the delta per se, what I'm telling is that because already the companies operating are mostly in the regulated side, for them it may not be a big challenge. That is the point I'm telling. Right. Right. Great. So now uh, we'll just open it up for uh, audience question. We do have one question from an audience member. Uh, Jagan wants to know if anybody is working on Objective C and Swift with SAS and source code. I assume SCA source code audit or source code review. Do you recommend? And then if you could also throw light on your security observability stack. So Jagan is here. Maybe he can clarify what he means by observability. But maybe the first question uh, some of you could take forward. Yeah, I think I can take a stab uh, and uh, maybe Ankur and uh, Prabhakar, you can add on. Um, so uh, I think uh, software composition analysis, for software composition analysis, we use Dependable, um, uh, Jagat. And uh, for Objective 3 and Swift, uh, there were some tools that we could look at from a SaaS perspective, but we chose to use a single tool, SEMgrep, and write multiple rules on it. Uh, because the one thing that we found was uh, it's more difficult to maintain multiple tools. So we said, okay, we'll just port all the rules to some them. And that's what we did with infrastructure as code as well. Um, so uh, yeah, went with some grep. And for the observability stack, uh, so we did experiment with a couple of tools, and there's also one experimentation going on right now. Uh, but the one thing that we realized was uh, going with whatever the the rest of the team uh, has in terms of like developers and devops would make more sense and kind of custom fitted there would be more uh, was easier for us so we use vajra internally so we wrote our dashboards also on vajra okay thank you so much yeah i think for us also for objective c and and uh, swift uh, our custom rules on semgap has worked a lot better than any other two and as rightly mentioned by ashwath i think it's very, very difficult to maintain two or three tools because the reporting structure would change. The common vulnerability management systems would change. Um, and for ease of use, I think, um, and in, I mean, indefinitely, basically, our, our custom rules work better than uh, any other open source tools. Okay. Yeah, you have a couple of tools part of your pipeline. So you can use uh, some you know, freeware uh, open source tools and you can build your custom rules on top of it. And also you can use you know infrastructure as a code or your SAS. And also now uh, we have identity checks like you know, source code composition. And there's multiple uh, uh, you know, scans you do before you go to your CD, the part of CA itself, so that you know, uh, it will give you a lot of visibility. Then again, you will do the fixing and you can also apply the gates uh whether to promote to next level or not so uh, that gives a lot of you know conflict of course when you talk about shift left by the time it comes to your report to the ci a uh, lot of things would have been already filtered yeah right great thank you uh, uh jagan is uh happy with the answers uh salvador has asked how do you manage data discovery on endpoints any, um, anybody would like to take a stab at that? Um, I think I can take a stab. I, I don't know if you mean like, uh, how do we figure out the routes on a given endpoint? Uh, so there are three pieces to it, right? So the first piece is how do you figure out like all of the subdomains that are there under a domain, for example, razorpay.com, api.razorpay.com, payroll.razorpay.com and so on. So that we use, uh, since we are kind of white box and we have access to our AWS environment, we hook it up with Route 53. Then the second point is around discovery of all the routes on a given endpoint. Uh, we are experimenting with a tool uh, called Acto, which is an Indian startup. Uh, so they do provide uh, this particular feature where uh, it will tell you all of the routes that are active. Uh, and we also have hooks into our uh, routes, dot, uh, routes file in the given repository. So that's the second piece. And the third piece is wherever sensitive data is flowing into our environment. That's also where the third party tool called Acto kind of helps, uh, helps us out. Great, great. Um, uh, I, 
I think this is, if I understand Salvador's question correctly, it's mainly how do you discover, for example, card numbers floating around on a particular user's endpoint? Yeah, that's where Acto comes in handy for us, KK. Yeah. Anko, you wanted to add? Yeah, I think uh, I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, I think he's clarified. Uh, it's about BI. I was confused uh, with the word endpoint, what exactly he meant with it. So I think rightly pointed out as well. But for us, in terms of endpoints, I think uh, we have tried creating our own sort of a database with all our public endpoints uh, listed there with all our parameters uh, and everything probably in a day if changes, if, if we get an alert and, and uh, we do analysis on what has gone wrong or uh, if we have missed something in the CICD and then uh, probably add that particular endpoint in our CICD. So that's what probably Actor also does for you as well, if I'm not wrong. Act to make more, it internally. Yeah. Act to more sits on the edge, Ankur. It sits at yeah. the ALB level where it mirrors the traffic and then it figures out pattern. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, any more questions from the audience? You can just type them into the chat box. Okay. So I think uh, those were the two questions for the moment. Um, one of the aspects that we, that, okay, there is one question. If, if I may, uh, Anvisha's question, what is the percentage of budget assigned to security out of the entire IT budget? Or is it a separate budget or is it baked in with the, within the departments? Is it part of a departmental budget? I think all three of you will have to answer this. It might be different for each company. Yeah, uh, from my level, because I'm at a level where, you know, my, uh, this thing is a little different. We mm, we beg the budget across. So because every uh, team has to you know budget a lot of things and part of it, a uh, couple of you know either from tooling perspective or resources perspective, they have to also equip themselves. So that's why it's spread across. So every team will do, and we work collaboratively and we make those you know investments happen. Uh, if development team requires certain tools or certain resources, certain example like you know threat modeling, whatever it is, you know certain training. So we ensure that uh, they are equipped with it and they are provided with it. Similar IT side, operation side, etc. So everybody requires uh, uh, you know those areas, but we drive them and we tell them this is what you have to have. So that's how we spread it across, and every function will get their piece. And uh, together it is catered. It's not like you know. At least um, I don't practice that. At least I don't say that uh, I take entire budget and give it to you people. No, it, it, we, we don't do that. We work with them and collaboratively and every one of us will uh, take that uh, uh, no piece and uh, make it happen. Okay, great. Uh, Ankur, Ashwat, sure. for you, how does the budgeting process work? Right. Not sure if I'm equipped they're allowed to speak a percentage of the budget, but... <laughs> I think um, broad, we, not a percentage number, but just broad logic principles of how. But, budget. Yeah, uh, on top of my mind, I think what we have done till now it has done a fantastic job in, in convincing our leaders how important security is for them and for the company. Um, and we've been able to do this by showing them the value of it, uh, you know, creating security champions, scaling security without even hiring, uh, making a big security engineering team or a governance compliance team, right? So creating value out of security, and I, th I think that's a major win for a security team uh, within the company where um, within a certain budget, we have been able to do a fantastic job till now. So till now, not face any difficulty in getting whatever is needed because our leaders know how and uh, how basically security is important for them. Great. Yeah. Ashwat, any thoughts on budgeting? Sure. Um... So I think there are two pieces to it, right? So the first piece is the compliance. Compliance is more of uh, the cost of running business. So whatever is required from a compliance perspective, it has to happen. Um, so that's where, you know, whatever basic tools, CSPM, blah, 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 all of those pieces come in. Then from a security perspective, I think we do like a top-down approach where we say, okay, what are the company's OKRs? And what are the two or three areas that we want to go do a deep dive on, right? So we go do a deep dive and we evaluate uh, if there are any open source tools. Uh, instead of going and buying a big fancy tool, paying you know hundred thousand dollars, we try to see if we can achieve the same with basically cost optimization, right? 
and uh, you know when we go present to the management we need to have like a lot of answers ready uh, because we do get a lot of tough questions so uh, yeah th that's basically you know how the budgeting piece works and uh, you know there are scenarios where uh, we might not have budgeted for a tool but it'll still get approved because that's the need of the hour uh, so uh, that's basically how it works Excellent. Salvador has a question. Uh, does a breach help? Uh, I I don't know. The, at least in the Indian context, I've seen breaches happen, and then there is no news about it later on. I think. But I think it has helped. It has helped to a to a extent where investors are now very serious about this. Uh -huh. um, so I think it has helped in top down. It has helped uh, to a certain extent. I think. Yeah, it's also I think spread awareness amongst the peer companies, right? Like for example. When there was a breach at MobiQuick, I'm sure all the wallet payment companies uh, management started to ask deeper questions on it. Same with Big Basket. So I think I'm just taking these recent names, but all sectors have been impacted by a breach or ransomware. SpiceJet had ransomware. I'm sure all the airlines uh, in India were suddenly asking their the management must have been asking their IT and security teams questions on that. So yeah, breach does definitely help. Oh, we do have another question. Uh, from a threat eval perspective, are independent threat actors hired to hard test the application perimeter? Yeah, actually, this is a great question, Anvisha. I remember during the pre-panel discussion, uh, Ashwat, you had mentioned that you do use uh, bug bounty platforms. Um, can you share with us how has your experience been with them? And of course, if, if the other two panelists also in your organization use it, please share. But we'll start with Ashwat. Sure, sure. sure. Um, so we do use hacker one uh, so the process was we started really small um, and uh, we went with a private program we said okay three or four endpoints 15 researchers and uh, initially we did not get any reports at all so then we were like okay what's going on kind of a thing so then we worked with them and apparently what had happened was our uh, bounty uh, requirement was not enough so then we had to up the bounty requirement and we had to provide more clarifications so basically what it meant was for the bug bounty hunters, you know, I put in a lot of effort, I'm not going to get enough money. Though we were providing money, the clarification was not clear to them. So then they've just moved on to the next piece, right? Um, but uh, it's been a long journey. I think we've learned a lot. Uh, my recommendation to others would be start really small, start with a private program first, figure out how you want to handle incidents. Because the minute you go public, uh, you know, this was a real experience for us. Uh, I was woken up four times in the night, uh, so uh, because it will cause like a bunch of five Xs. Right? So the first piece is they identify subdomains. This won't cause any noise. The second piece is they'll send like all possible URLs. Let's say you know there are thousand subdomains, then there are like hundred thousand sample URLs. So hundred thousand times you know this number, they're going to hit you with it, right? And you know one IP can like cause like, thousands of alerts. So Basically, you need to fine tune your system. Was the point I was trying to make. Though we have said no automated scanners, they still you know, they they just go off. So, uh, yeah, the quick point is uh, we do have hacker one, and that's really helped us out in finding some really good vulnerabilities. So my point is, be iterative, uh, figure out what the right bounty amount looks like, and just be very specific in what is in scope and what is out of scope. Great. Those are some great inputs. Uh, thank you, Ashwin. Anyone else here has used uh, bug bounty programs, private, public? Yeah, I think Flipkart, we started the Hacker One program uh, long back and it has matured uh, to a greater extent now. Uh, at PhonePay, we are yet to start one, but we have a responsible disclosure page where we invite uh, researchers to report bug, bug to us. Uh, no, no rewards program as of now, but we launch it soon. Uh, because of being a bug hunter, in my past, I know the pain of finding a bug and not getting rewarded. So I understand that and uh, for sure we'll, we'll start rewarding people. But I think um, it is not only reward or they they summoning as a bug, it's it's more towards working with the community and mm -hmm. making our own product much secure. They, they in inherently become part of our security team because you'll be able to identify security bugs in a company where uh, there's a hacker one kind of a program only when you try and spend much more time the first moment you come to a platform and then you start searching for a bug, it, it is nearly impossible to find a bug unless you know what has changed in the new upgrade or new update. That there have been people where, you know, uh, the moment you update the app, they know what feature is new and they start attacking it, right? So 
I think it has gone to that extent and people have been very, very professional doing this. Excellent. Excellent. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, you know, quickly, uh, we have a couple of minutes, so I want to summarize uh, some of the key takeaways from today. Uh, I filled up two pages of notes and I hope that uh, those in the audience also did that. So without, uh, you know, saying who said what, because that will take more time. But I think some of the key inputs obviously have been that shift left security is no longer a talking point. It is happening on the ground. Uh, a lot of tooling is already in place. Um, tech startups, tech companies have led the way. And I think uh, more traditional companies are also now uh, trying hard to, to adopt the same uh, tools. Um, some of the specific tools that were mentioned, SEMGREP, of course, was mentioned multiple times. Homegrown scripts to do data discovery um, for uh, Kubernetes. Uh, KUP Bench was mentioned. The AWS functionality of Kubernetes scanning hardened images, um, and you know, again, custom scripting for uh, secure logging, uh, parsing the logs as they come into your log management tool, etc. Evangelizing security across layers through through explaining to people what how important their role is, why security matters, what could be the impact if they miss even a single SQL injection or a single input validation uh, check, you know, um, and um, the importance. I think the the biggest challenge is that you all have uh, managed to overcome to a large extent is that. The, the business is so dynamic, the market needs are so dynamic, speed is of such an essence, users are so uh, finicky, I would say, including all of us, that if you over-engineer security, you will actually directly negatively impact your business and might even be out of a job. So it's such a sensitive uh, space to be in. Um, you know, uh, where, where users want both, they want fraud protection, they want data protection, yet they don't want to key in a secure password. So it's, it's been, it, I'm sure at the front lines of where you all are, it's much tougher than for many of us who are more comfortable providing consulting services to you guys. Um, and then I think some of the other, uh, inputs were data discovery, we spoke about. Um, Acto was a tool that you mentioned. I have not heard of it. I'll be sure to check that out. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, QA, QA being an important part and then tailing, uh, tailing security into the QA process. And also, Ankur, you mentioned about how you've now even started doing uh, PRD and design reviews from a security perspective, not just the tooling part. So great, thank you so much uh, for all your uh, inputs. And we've just uh, overshot by a minute. So I think if the organizers have any closing remarks, I would please uh, request them to do that. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today. It was a very enlightening conversation. Um, we have more talks coming up. Uh, so we'll have a talk every Tuesday and Friday. And we're also doing a series with Razorpay. We have two talks on the upcoming Wednesdays. Uh, so please join in. Um, register at privacy mode, uh, hasgeek.com slash privacy mode slash PPG. And we hope to see more of you there. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.